Associate Professor James Lin. Mr. Speaker, the Electronic Vehicles Charging Bill is a step toward institutionalizing the process for the transition of our transportation infrastructure into the 21st century. The fundamental problem it seeks to address is this. How will the Land Transport Authority and Energy Market Authority work together to ensure that the charging infrastructure is sufficient during the transition and, relatedly, how such charging costs will be regulated? I support the bill but have additional suggestions. The bulk of my speech will address the hard infrastructure issues that are the primary concern of the bill. However, I will conclude with thoughts on how soft infrastructure, in particular our COE system, can also play a role in helping Singapore usher in the electrification of its vehicle fleet. Throughout, my focus will be on practical considerations associated with this transition process. Parts Two through seven of the bill empowers LTA to constrain unregulated or inadequately maintained charges by imposing minimal standards. Providers are also required to obtain fixed duration licenses and to meet conditions such as minimal uptimes and securing public liability insurance. On the whole, these are in line with best practice international frameworks such as the UN Global Technical Regulation on the Electric Vehicle Safety, albeit it remains somewhat less ambitious than stricter standards such as the EU regulation number 540-2014. Of paramount concern is whether new EV charging stations will adequately address consumer safety concerns, including the risk of electric shocks, battery-related fire, and cyber hacking. Fires are a particularly salient concern given the number of recent reports of HDB fires due to PMDs and the general density of our multi-storey parking structures. Minister Iswaran alluded to this. In Sengkang alone, I am aware of at least two over the past two years, and Minister Shamugam has shared with this house that there were 18 PMD fires across the island last year, all of which the SCDF and LTA had determined to be non due to non-compliance with safety standards. Beyond fires, per se, our humid tropical environment may present greater maintenance challenges, which in turn calls for more attention to ongoing regulation of the charging infrastructure. What safety features and public education efforts has the Ministry put in place to address such concerns? At the moment, the Bill, in Parts 5, 6 and 10, focuses mainly on technical and or intended offences. The pertinent question is how inadvertent violations that compromise safety can best be handled, as this also tends to be the case with PMD charging related fires. Part 8 will expand the charging network by requiring new buildings with car parks to install charging points for around, as Minister Itswaran uh, helpfully clarified, the technical mumbo jumbo, uh, around 4% of the total uh, car and motorcycle lots. This is a good start and has been adopted in other crowded Asian cities such as Tokyo. The practical challenge here is how to ensure that there are sufficient stations for EV owners wishing to charge their vehicles and relatedly how to prevent hogging of said, said charges after charging is complete. After all, many would enjoy the convenience of being able to charge overnight, which is especially attractive given, at least for now, the lower costs of electricity after hours. The flip side of the strategy, however, is that it would typically preclude the timely relinquishment of the station. One management approach is to adopt the strategy employed by Tesla, which charges a per minute idle fee for vehicles that are already fully charged with a higher penalty rate if all chargers are also simultaneously fully occupied. Even with such a, such a system, there may be insufficient charging for certain user types, the so-called power users, which would be, for instance, taxi cabs and PhD, PHC drivers, which are likely to be able to charge only during off-peak hours and require larger, 
charging, lo longer charging durations. Some degree of calibration would undoubtedly be necessary, but one interim step may be for LTA to coordinate with PHC and taxi cab companies to obtain the distribution of their registered drivers and adapt initial installation at MSCPs accordingly. This could mean pursuing an active policy target that exceeds the minimum number of charging points per building as stipulated by law. Part 13 of the bill, in particular Clause 97, is designed to expand the network for the, manage, for the MCST car parks, which do not directly fall under LTA, and hence require more targeted incentive structures to encourage adoption. In July last year, LTA launched the Electric Vehicle Common Charger Grant, or ECCG, to promote the installation of charging infrastructure in non-landed private residences, a practice in line with other nations, such as Canada and the United Kingdom. This bill further relaxes the hurdle rate for the installation and removal of chargers, along with other charger management functions, to a simple majority. This is a clear improvement, as previously some MCSTs may have required as much as a 90% vote share to pass the necessary resolutions. My Workers' Party colleague, Dennis Tan, will suggest a tailored approach to the expansion of coverage, especially for industrial premises. I concur. In principle, MCSTs such as condominiums as well as commercial and industrial developments should have a stronger incentive for charger installation, given the typically higher income profile of residents, overall heightened environmental consciousness of wealthy households, the ongoing flow of tenants and customers for such projects, and the likelihood of a profitable income stream. The ECCG co-funding model should have provided the rest of the necessary boost. Yet the barrier to more widespread adoption seems more psychological than monetary. After all, inertia is a powerful force, and those of us who have lived in condos and served on condo boards understand how apathetic most condo dwellers are about attending the annual AGM. Le this leaves one to wonder whether more can be done to empower MCST and commercial facilities to roll out even more charging stations. Could policy target a higher minimum ratio for stations in non-landed private residences beyond legislation? This would ensure that these developments do not inadvertently fall behind, even while it, the HDB rollout accelerates. Mr. Speaker, I will close with some thoughts on how our soft infrastructure can also be adapted and deployed to help with this EV transition. Singapore already has a built-in system for effecting a controlled phase-out of the existing internal combustion engine fleet. We can do this in at least two ways. The first is to adapt, adopt a fairly aggressive but backloaded strategy consistent with the Singapore Green Plan 2030. This means only permitting the registration of electric vehicles after that year. If we were to do so, this would effectively phase out the approximately 1 million strong ICE fleet over the course of the following decade, give or take several tens of thousands of heavy goods vehicles uh, that may be less amenable to electrification. The advantage of this approach is that it allows the existing electric charging infrastructure to roll out over the course of the next seven years without too much excess pressure from latent demand. That said, there is an alternative we can pursue a more gradualist strategy where we begin the issuance of EV-specific COE permits next year with an even split between the permits available for EVs and ICE vehicles. To further promote EV adoption, we could even provide temporary incentives that would favour the switch to EVs, such as a 10% discount, for instance, on the COE face value for EV permits. Then this way we can embark on the EV transition immediately. And as private charging providers receive even stronger incentive for switching now, they will also step up efforts to expand their networks. This solves, in some part, the chicken and egg problem of EV charger installers waiting for greater EV adoption before increasing charging capacity while potential EV purchasers hold off while they await more charging stations to appear. 
Done this way, incrementally, over 20 years, we would meet our full EV fleet target by 2042, only two years after the 2040 deadline, with a more gradual process that simultaneously begins with the EV transition occurring earlier. The COE system offers additional tools for us to encourage the switch to an EV fleet. For instance, there's some evidence that drivers of PHCs have expressed reluctance to switch to EVs owing to range anxiety and the much higher operating costs for EVs estimated at as much as 82% or greater. Yet, since PHCs are utilized at about seven times the rate of the average car, they account for a disproportionate share of emissions. One way to compel such switches is to designate a special COE category for PHCs that are also EVs. This risks off a, a query that my Sengkang colleague, Louis Chua, had put forward, albeit in the context of concerns over whether PHCs were bidding up COE prices. To the extent that this eventually does raise the co cost of regular ICE COEs, we can content ourselves that, at the very least, there is a beneficiary, which is the environment. Other approaches would be to provide subsidies or to offer a discount of the price of COEs in the PHC EV category. Mrs. Ward. Because may I just seek a clarification from member? Did he say that uh, PHC drivers express concern about the higher operating cost of EVs? I think he used the number of 80%. Is that correct? Uh, he, <coughs> uh, yes, Mr. I did. This was based off a report uh, in 2022, uh, reported in paultan.org, that said the EVs made up just 8.4% of new cars registered in Singapore, uh, with Grab drivers being reluctant to switch. It's not my own numbers, but uh, based no, on... Sorry, so, but it, sorry, paultan.org. Paultan.org, which and, is... Uh, and, and it says 80% higher operating costs for no, EVs? No. Uh, the, the estimated operating costs for EVs was as much as 82% greater, yes, that, that, based on that report. 